so let me let me sort of recall a little bit what we have been doing last time. So here is, is this this just a little summary. So we're talking about this Markov evolution equation, right? F zero is a density, and it's a density on the sphere S n minus one with radius squared of n, probability density, and then you evolve the F zero with this operator where the Q is given by this average over scatterings, and the scatterings are done with the Rijf, where you replace the ith and the jth variable by the post-collisional velocities, and you average with respect to some probability measure, rho theta, over the angles, right? So it's an extremely simple model. And last time we talked about the entropy, so we, we, we looked at, so in, in, in a way we, we showed last time that there is an entropy structure for this problem in the sense uh, Laurent de Villette uh, explained. So we introduced the dissipation, which is given by the integral of 1 minus qn f log f, and I have to put an n in front, and always, yeah, maybe I should say, unless I say anything else, an integral is always an integral over Sn minus 1 squared of n d sigma n. And this d sigma n is uniform normalized measure. Okay? Good. We also introduced the following quantity gamma n, which was, so, so by the way, so what is this? I should, I should maybe say, this dissipation comes out by taking the entropy, integral f log f, and what do we do? We differentiate the entropy with respect to t at t equals zero. That gives you precisely d of f zero, right? That's the, the dissipation. And I forgot there's a minus sign. Right? So that's what we showed last time. And then we, we introduced what is called the entropy production gamma n, which is d of f divided by s of f. But this time, we take the infimum over all densities with integral equals 1. Okay? And then we talked about Villani's theorem. You see, what you would like to have is, uh, you would like to, in some sense, compute this number, and then you sort of hope for the best, right? You hope that this number is not terrible in the sense that it goes to 0 as n goes to infinity or something like that, right? And the story is really bleak because, first of all, we have Villani's theorem, which says that gamma n is greater or equals 2 over n minus 1, when rho is equal to just 1 over 2 pi. And we have also Einhoff's theorem, for any theta positive, there exists theta so that gamma n is less or equals c theta divided by n to the 1 minus a. Okay? So in some sense, uh, this, this was actually, con Villani, Villani con conjectured that this is more or less the right behavior in n, and more or less that proves it. Right? Anyway, but let's try, uh, we, we, what I wanted to show you is how to prove that theorem because it raises a bunch of interesting mathematics. We did last time, we showed, we started out with an induction argument here on this problem in terms of n. We inducted in n. So, induction worked like this. Df, we were able to estimate it, sorry, now, by gamma n minus 1. So, I should maybe put an n here. Huh? This would be better, I think. 
because it really depends on n. That's, of course, the point. Huh? Okay, so, and here we got n over n minus 1, the entropy, and then comes, unfortunately, another term, which is gamma n minus 1, 1 over n minus 1. And here comes a sum k, pkf log p. What is pkf? There are two ways of, of, of thinking about this. On the one hand, you can just integrate f over the normalized measure on the sphere s n minus 2 square root of n minus v k squared. Right? So in other words, what you do is you fix the variable vk. That gives you a subsphere, right? When you cut your sphere uh, at the level vk, and now we integrate f over the normalized surface measure of that sphere. And that's a projection. Another way of thinking about the pkf is by just thinking what do I do? I take my function and I average it over all rotations which fix the vk axis. That's the same thing, right? Okay. All right, so, so in a way, another, another third way of saying what this pkf is, in a certain sense, it is a marginal, right? You take your density and you take the marginal with respect to all variable except the, mar uh, the, 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 the variable vk. But it's a little bit complicated because these variables are dependent. Okay, so now the theorem, so, so in some sense, what, what is our goal? Our goal is to find an estimate on a lower bound on the ratio of this number divided by the entropy. So we have to estimate this right-hand side in terms of the entropy. This is a theorem. So this is theorem, well, let's leave it here. Uh, so again, F in L1 of the sphere as n minus 1 square root of n, integral f equals 1, and then the sum k equals 1 up to n, integral pkf log pkf, that's equals twice f log f. Okay? That's what this result is. And this is a result which was proved by Carlin myself. And <clears throat> so, so let, let, let me make a few comments about this, this result here. It's very easy to see that the, the number two is actually sharp. Right? That's, that's easy. And, and the way you think about this is the following. Let me draw it by pictures. And of course, it's very hard to put pictures in n dimensions when n is 10 to the 26. But morally, it, it, it works out. You see, what you're going to do is you, you take a function. So here's the north pole, if you like. That, that's the one axis, right? And now what you do, uh, I, should, I cannot go up that far. Huh? This is the one axis. So you make, what you're going to do is you make a very high characteristic function of a tiny little set, but you integrate this to be 1, right? So this function has a certain height h, and this has a certain area a, which I call epsilon to the power n minus 1, right? Because the epsilon is roughly the dimension of this patch. Remember, this here is s n minus 1. Okay? So, what do we need? We need that the integral of this function f, the integral of this function f should be 1. So that forces you, remember, epsilon is really, really tiny. Huh? So this is flat, basically. So you get that h is of the order epsilon minus n plus 1, and the a, as I said, is of the order epsilon n minus 1. Okay? And you notice this function is, of course, radially symmetric. In other words, when I apply the p1 to it, it just gives me back the same function. Okay? Right? Remember, 
This is the one axis. So when a rotate this function, it stays invariant. So when an average, it stays invariant. Okay? Now, what happens when you take PKF, when K is not equals to 1? Well, you notice that, so, so you have an axis which goes now out this way. But what you know is that when you average this thing, this stays always a good portion away from the North Pole, and it stays a good portion away from the South Pole. And this has nothing to do with the dimension. That's just the way it is, right? So what you get is that this PKF is a function which essentially, when this is very, very small, is a characteristic function now. But what it is, it's a band on the SN minus 1. Band, right? And what is, so PKF is, a, is again a function of height. H, area, A, little a. What is little a? Well, this time the little a is of the order of epsilon, because this is a band, right? And therefore, because the whole integral of this function should be still 1, the h must be of the order epsilon to the minus 1. Okay? So that's what this pkf is. All right. So now let's go on and check out these terms here. So you notice that the integral, the integral of p1f log f, log p1f, well, that's, of course, just integral f log f. And you see, that eats up half of these two here. And now you have to ask yourself what happens with the PKFs. Well, the PKFs, what is the entropy? Yeah, by the way, what is the entropy here? We should, we should actually compute it. Well, that's easy. Why? Because when f is equal to 0, the entropy is 0, right? f log f is 0 when f is equal to 0. And on, on, on the top here, this is just log h times the integral f, which is 1. So that's just the logarithm of epsilon to the minus n plus 1, which is minus n minus 1 log epsilon. I think you would agree with that, right? Okay? That's what this entropy is. And now, what is the entropy of integral pkf log pkf? What do you get? Well, this is, again, same reasoning. It's more or less a characteristic function with tiny little arrows, maybe. But what you get is that this is equals to, I should say, yeah. Well, the height is epsilon minus 1, so you get minus log epsilon times the integral of pkf, which is 1. Okay? So now you see what happens. How many such terms do you have? n minus 1. And so when you add this up, you remember the log epsilon gets very, very negative because epsilon is small, right? So this behaves roughly like minus 2n minus 1 log epsilon, which is twice this f log f, right? You see, it's the simple fact that, that, you, that, that you get a 2 here is because you eat it up half of it because this function already is f log f, right? This is very different when you go, for example, into, into Rn. And let's make this point here. It's a very elementary point. Suppose you have a density f on Rn. And you divide, define the marginal m i of f I mean, this is not totally trivial what I'm going to explain to you. Huh? So this is a, a density, so in other words, the f over Rn is equal to 1. And mi f is simply defined as the integral of f of all its variables, v1. And now the vi variable, you, well, I don't even have to write this down. I can just write dv1, dv i hat dvn. And what does this mean? It means that it did not integrate over the ith variable. Huh? Yeah. 
Vamos ver. Uh, yeah, no, no, I mean, I mean it, it, that would have to, so, the, so the, this would have to do with the proof of that inequality. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so physically, what this means is, what you have, we have to maybe ask ourselves, what are the bad configurations, right, for the CAPS model? And the bad configurations are precisely this, where you have a substantial part of the mass uh, uh, centered at the poles. And that takes a very long time. Imagine what this means. Suppose you stick all the mass at V1. This means that only one particle has all the mass, and all the others. So it's kind of a yeah. Exactly. That's right. That's right. That's precisely the intuition, right? Because you concentrate too much into a very small system, and the other system virtually has no energy, and then it takes forever okay. for the collisions, right? Yes, that's right. Exactly. And this is this is what I'm going to talk about. Okay. Yeah. I mean, this is in some sense the question. What kind of reasonable states can you write down which avoids these problems? Right? That's going to be the... the, 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 the yeah, exactly. Very good. Now, that's a, th thank you for making this remark. This is good. Okay, so, but, so let, me, let me now uh, finish this elementary example. You see, I, I claim now, and this is totally elementary to show, to show when I take MIF log... MIF, and the sum on I, I equals 1 to N, this is always less than the integral F log F. And the proof is, is, is extremely elementary, right? Because what you do is, you write this thing out in the following way. You take here the product of the MIFs, log F divided by the product of the MIFs, here, product M. Then dv1 up to dvn. Okay? This is what you start with. And you notice what I've done. I mean, in some sense, I've written down the relative entropy of f with respect to this product. But I'm writing this by dividing here and multiplying here. Now, why do I multiply? The reason why I multiply is because this product here, here is a probability measure. And that's, of course, extremely elementary, right? Because when you integrate, these guys are independent now. So what you get is just n times the integral f. But the integral f is 1. So this is a probability measure. OK? Good. So therefore, what can you do? Because this function x log x is a convex function, you can use Rienzi's inequality. And you get that this quantity is what? It's greater or equals. The integral of this quantity against this measure, which is just integral f, which is 1, times the logarithm of this quantity integrated against this measure, which is again log f, integral f. But the integral f is 1, so this is equal to 0, right? It's extremely elementary. And unfortunately, such kind of arguments, uh, it would be lovely, right, to apply to this inequality but uh, we are not quite there because these two we don't really understand. I mean, this example explains it, it's good, but how does it come in? All right? Great, so let me just check that I have. Yeah, let me also mention that Cedric had, has a particular conjecture about this. And this, this conjecture says, if you assume that the initial condition has fourth moments of order n, hmm? So should, let, me, let, me, let me write this here in this corner here. So suppose the integral of f0, sum of the vi fourth, is less or equal to constant times n. So what does this mean? You see, what is vi? Suppose you concentrate on a pole. Then the vi squared is of order n. Right? Because you see, that you're on the sphere of radius squared of n, the vi, when I concentrate on the pole, is square root of n. 
when I raise it to the fourth power, I get n squared. So what this does, in a certain sense, it depresses the function f0 near the poles. And his conjecture is, if you assume that, you should get entropy production at an exponential rate. You know that, right? Okay? That's his conjecture. So you should have exponential decay in entropy. And by the way, let me mention, this argument which you gave so far is not going to work. Because you would think that you could improve this inequality under this assumption here. You cannot. That's unfortunate. Because you see, I can just take a tiny little fraction here, of fraction 1 over n. Still, the entropy would be huge, would still be log epsilon. Because you know these, these, these powers just go along for the ride. So you cannot beat this inequality. You cannot improve that. Okay? All right. Good. So let's go on and, and, and start thinking about how to prove such kind of problems. Yeah, may, uh, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me finish, of course, uh, the argument. Sorry. So we have now this inequality here. So let me go on and finish the proof of Villani's theorem. So you see, we have now an estimate on this, which says that this is less or equals twice in S of f. So therefore, we get that this gadget is greater or equals gamma n minus 1. Here you have an n. Here you have a 2. You have the same denominator, so you get n minus 2 over n minus 1 times the entropy S of n. And now you just iterate this. And you notice, that I computed this last time, that gamma 2 is equals 2. And you learn that gamma n is greater or equals 2 over n minus 1. That's easy. Huh? All right. OK, good. So then let's go back to this kind of, I would like to call them entropy inequalities. These kind of inequalities show up very, very often, and therefore I would like to sort of expand a little bit on it, because that's kind of useful. So let me first start with a, a very general remark. Again, it's completely elementary, but quite useful. Let me... Notice here, in this little, uh, little example here, I used Jensen's inequality. And Jensen's inequality you can actually use to prove the following lemma. So x mu is just a measure space. And you have a density, f density d mu over f. Then the integral of f log f over x d mu is equals to the supremum over all phi's of the integral of f phi over x minus the log of the integral e to the phi d mu. So this is a what you call a Legendre transform, right? In some sense, this is the dual function this is the function dual to that function here. Of course, I have to assume that the integral of f is 1. And the proof is, is quite elementary, because what you do is you pick any phi, pick any phi, and you form e to the phi divided by the integral e to the phi. Of course, you have to make sure that these things are integrable, right? Okay, otherwise, it doesn't make any sense anyway. And let's call this function psi. And then you do precisely what I did before. You, you compute f divided by psi, log f divided by psi, psi d mu. 
Notice again, this is a probability measure. That's because the way it's cooked it up. Therefore, this is positive. Can you still see? OK. And now, you just work this thing out what it is, right? When you, when you pull things apart, one term is integral f log f. Then you get, you see this psi cancels out. And then you get from this 1 over psi, you get a minus integral f phi. Right? And then you have to, you should not forget the normalization here. The normalization comes up. That comes with a plus. And that's positive, right? So that shows that this quantity here is always greater or equals that quantity here. Now we have to check that the supremum is actually equal. Well, that's maybe not so important, but it's usually use, useful to do. Well, what do you do? You choose to phi cleverly, and when you choose phi to be the logarithm of f, you get equality. So this is a, a useful device because in some sense it reduces proof of any kind of entropy inequality always to the computation of such an integral. And there's a vast technique behind computation of such integrals here. OK, so let me erase this now, because the next few, uh, what shall I say, the next half hour, I'm not going to talk now about cuts. I'm talking more generally about inequalities of a certain type. They are known as brass camp leap inequalities. Now, let me just write down an inequality which is fundamental and will actually give us this result when we just apply this lemma. The inequality is the following. Yeah. Let me start it over here. Here. Once again, Carlin. And it's, it's completely uh, disgustingly easy when you write it down. The proof is a little bit more tricky. So imagine you have j functions, and you evaluate each, each function at the coordinate vj. Hmm? So, so you have to imagine, right? You have the sphere n minus 1, n minus 1 dimension, but you have given n functions, and these are functions of a single variable. And now what you do is you take the product and you integrate it over the sphere. So let me again write it here. It doesn't really matter what the radius of the sphere is. Point is that the measure should be always normalized. OK. So now what would you like to do? You would like to estimate in terms of some LP norms. What you can show is that this is less or equals the product j equals 1 to n. And here you put the fj norm on the sphere. This is on the sphere. Huh? You see, each function is a function on the sphere. You can look at it this way because the vj, right, is a coordinate on the sphere. So you integrate this function, you square it, and you integrate it on the sphere. The constant 1 is sharp. You, can do it. you cannot do better. And the 2 is also sharp in the sense that you can uh, replace the 2 by something bigger, but you can never replace it by something smaller. And why? Because if you could, this inequality couldn't be true. It would be true for a smaller number. Anyway. So these are what is called a, a, a geometric, I mean, a, a new version of the brass camp leap inequality. We'll explain it later what this is. So let's try to, to understand how we get the entropy inequality from that. Okay? And you see, this is precisely the point. Because what you do, what are we going to do? So proof 
So what was it? I called it, let me call this theorem one. And let me call this theorem two. Okay, so what you do is you're going to choose the fj to be so fj of vj. That's our choice. Huh? So we make, we, we're going to prove of theorem. Write this better. Okay, and now what you do is, yeah. How are you gonna apply this lemma? Hmm? But you have to ask yourself, what should the phi be? Let me think of a sort of I want to check that it didn't screw up the computation. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, look, th that's right. You, you're going to read this inequality in a slightly different way. You're going to put it here, the square root. And why do you put the square root? Because then you get the integral of the product of the square root of the PJFs is less or equals the product of the L2 norm of the square roots, which is nothing but the integral of PJF to the power 1 half. But these guys are 1 anyway. You agree? So this guy is equals to 1. So what you know automatically is that this is a probability measure. Right? Okay? Good. So therefore, what we're going to do is now, we're going to choose phi to be what? Phi is going to be, so sorry, e to the phi is going to be the product of the square roots, pjf. And now you go to this lemma. What do you know? Well, you know that e to the phi, the mu, we just showed it, uh, well, it's maybe not a probability measure, but I know that the integral is less or equals 1, right? That's what this inequality tells me. Therefore, the logarithm is negative with a, uh, <clears throat> yeah, and with a minus sign, it's positive. So when I drop this, I get a lower bound. Agreed? So this here is less or equals 1. This is negative with this minus sign, it's positive. When I drop it, I get that this quantity is greater or equals that quantity. Forget about the soup, okay? So now what is it? So all I have to do is I have to compute the integral x f phi. So what is it? Well, phi is the sum with a half in front of the logarithms of pjf. So therefore we know by this lemma, lemma, what was it called? Uh, just lemma. That's, that the integral of f phi is equals the integral of f pk f sum on k with a half in front. Sorry, log pk. Okay, so we are therefore at the stage that we know, because of this inequality there, that Integral of f log f is greater or equals the sum with the half in front, k equals 1 to n, integral f log. And now you realize, because this function depends only on the variable vk, you can actually average this f freely over all rotations which keep the vk axis fixed, so you're free to put here a pkf. But you see, you have this one half in front. And that you push over 
here, and that proves the theorem. Okay? This is how these things work. Okay? So in some sense, that's this lemma which helps in this way. I mean, you can also do it simpler uh, by some, some elementary Jensen, but I would like to really push this lemma a little bit. This is an idea which, goes, which was used heavily by Carlin and Cordero Arauskin. Proving entropy inequalities, right? Okay, good. So, so we have now this theorem one. That's great. So the question comes how you prove something like that, right? And here things get a little bit hairy. So let me tell you what is the idea. So you see, very often, what do we do? We use entropy inequalities and all these kind of things to show that certain flows converge to equilibrium, right? And, and however, there is also a way, so, so what is it? It's the idea of a Lyapunov function, right? Because the Lyapunov function tells in general something about the flow near the equilibrium. And what you do now here, you can also do the opposite. You can take an inequality which you try to prove, and you try to invent the flow for which this inequality is a Lyapunov function. Okay? That's a, a quite a fruitful idea. This has been done in many, many circumstances. And you can also do it in this connection here. So let me explain this. Now, of course, you can always say, my goodness, how do you get to these ideas? And, and of course, this is simply experience, right? You try whatever you can. And, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So let me, let me explain. So how to prove theorem two? So what you're going to do is to follow it. We're going to replace. So uh, uh, first of all, let me rewrite this inequality in the, in the following way. I would like to put here square root of fj. I hope you don't mind. I just replace the fj by square root. And then this inequality just looks this way. Product integral fj to the power 1 half, right? So, so here's the idea. <clears throat> we take fj, which is a function of vj, and we replace it by e to the Laplacian t, f of vj t. Laplacian t, fj of vj. And the Laplacian is just the Laplace Beltrami of the sphere as n minus 1. Well, how do you think about it? I, I like to think of in this way. You sum over all alpha and beta, L alpha beta squared. And what is L alpha beta? It's V alpha d beta minus V beta d alpha. Okay? This is... You see, these vector fields, so to speak, are tangent to the sphere. That's the point, right? Because when you take a radial function and you differentiate, then you always pull down a v beta, and here a v alpha, these things cancel out. Okay? Or put it differently, these are just angular derivatives in the alpha beta plane. F of vj. And they should say an FJ here. Huh? It's, yeah. Huh? Yeah, this is, this is, it's, it's just F. There's nothing, else, okay? Yeah, no, no, this is good. This is good. Yeah. So, by the way, who has seen this kind of notation? Nobody. I mean, this is what physicists do. And it's a very useful way of thinking about, for computations. Yeah? Okay? Extremely useful. Okay. So now, 
so, so the Laplacian is this gadget here, right? And now you have a semigroup. That's very nice. I mean, there's, there's no problem in defining that. And what you do is you, you apply this e to the Laplacian t to this fj. And now you notice and this is, that it's still a function only of fj, uh, of, of vj. Why? Well, because the Laplacian commutes with rotations. So therefore, uh, when you take any rotation which fixes the vj, you can commute it through the e to the Laplacian t. So therefore, and, and here it doesn't do anything. So therefore, this function can only be a function of vj. Okay? Good. So that's number one. Number two, why do I choose it? Well, it turns out, when you look at this integral over the sphere, the integral of f of vj t over the sphere is just the integral of fj. Why? Because the e to the Laplacian is a self-adjoint operator, and when you push it on the constant function, it preserves constant functions. Okay? So you see, you have already gained something. Namely, you have a flow which preserves the right-hand side. The right-hand side doesn't go anywhere. It's fixed. Okay? Now, what about the left-hand side? Well, let's analyze the problem as t goes to infinity. As this guy goes to infinity, e to the Laplacian t fj, what does it do as t goes to infinity? Well, as t goes to infinity, all the higher modes get damped out, right? You see, the eigenvalues of Laplacian are all negative. The first one is zero, and all the others are negative. So they die out exponentially fast, and therefore what you're left over is just the integral of fj of vj. That converges to fj of vj. So now you see, if you look at this, if you replace these fj's by these time-dependent functions, what happens to this in the limit as t goes to infinity? Well, the fj inside, you have to replace by the integral. The in then the product of this square roots, this is just a constant. This integral is normalized. You get precisely the right-hand side. Okay? All right. So how then can I prove this inequality? All I have to show is that the left side is an increasing function in time. And when I have done this, when I have proved this, I'm done. Okay? So to show, hence, we have to show that the left side is an increasing or I, so let's put it this way non decreasing function in time a non function All right, so, so what you have to do is, how do you check this? You just take the derivative and check that it's not negative, right? So that's a computation. I, can, I don't need this lemma anymore. So we have to compute DDT the integral of the product of F J V J. Good. So now, okay, there, there, there are many ways to compute it, but the most convenient one is notice this operator here, e to the Laplacian t, the FJ is a non negative function. In fact, this semigroup is actually uh, monotone, monotone uh, sorry, positivity improving, right? The function is not going to be zero anywhere when you start. This is essentially, what is it, Harnack or something, right? It's, it's, it's fairly obvious, okay? It's standard, let's put it this way. It's not obvious, but standard. Okay. 
All right, so now what you do is write the fj as e to the phi j. And now you compute. So now we know dfj dt is a Plaschen fj, right? This then implies that d phi j dt is Laplacian phi j, but then you get the correction term, which is the gradient of phi j squared. And you have to remember what these things are. This Laplacian is the sum of this L alpha beta squared. By the way, alpha and beta are just any indices, right? With a half in front. And what is this guy here? This one is just L alpha beta phi j squared sum alpha beta with a half in front. Okay? That's what it is. Okay, so now you compute that, right? I'm not gonna, I, I think I shouldn't do this on the board because I, I, I'm sure you make, make some mistakes. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So when, it, when you differentiate this, remember, when you, when you plug these guys in, you have here a half in front, right? When you, when you plug these guys in here. And then you have to sum on the fj. So when you compute this derivative, what you get? You get that this is equals to one half the sum on j, the integral grad phi j squared, minus one quarter sum j and m the integral grad phi j dot grad phi m. And here I put here a d mu and a d mu. What is d mu? d mu is nothing but e to the one half phi times d sigma m. So I just absorb the e to the, this, this, exp, this exponential here, which is an exponential, I just absorb it into, into the measure. Because now at this moment, I don't do any differentiation anymore. What I have done, however, is that this Laplacian, I have made an integration by parts, which gives me the second term. Right? So you all, do, all you do is you try to get down to first order terms. Good. And now, notice something. When you have an L alpha beta, on phi j. Now remember, this function phi j, what does it depend? It depends only on the variable vj. So the only L alpha beta is where the alpha is either j or the beta is j. These are the only contribution which you get. And now you use this very carefully, and what you notice is, it's not a miracle, it's just do the computation, that this gadget is a full square. Namely, what this is, it's one half Let me, I think it's, it's, yeah, no, I get one-eighth. Because there's no point in doing this computation. Because I'm anyway behind. Let's write it this way. Okay? It's a full square. Oh, you cannot see it. Let me write it up here. Sorry, sum alpha beta. Well, and that's of course clearly positive. So therefore this function as a function of time is increasing, right? In the limit, it converges precisely to the right hand side, and you already understand what are the optimizers. The optimizers are the constant functions, right? Okay? So this way, you can prove uh, such type of inequalities relatively easily. Huh? Now, you, you see, you think that this is a trick. Well, not really. You see, what you, th what you have to imagine in this business is always, what could the optimizers be? And the constant functions are a reasonable assumption that they're going to be the optimizers, right? 
And then you say, aha, so what kind of flow converts to a constant function? Then, of course, the easiest one to take is, of course, the heat equation. Right? So, now next time, I'm going to expand on this. Uh, namely, there is a whole class of inequalities which we're going to use, actually. They are called the Braskamp leap inequalities. And I will take only a special case of those. So, so what are, let, let me sort of give you a sort of a general view of such kind of inequalities. Suppose you have a bunch of functions, fj. And we, we, we're going to be just on R n. Huh? Suppose you have a bunch of functions, fj, and a bunch of matrices, they go from Rm to some, some Hilbert space, if you like. And this is a subspace of Rm. Hmm? I'm, I'm just saying, you see, I don't want to specify that it's Rk or whatever. They can be crooked, right? They can just hang in there. These are subspaces, OK? So these are subspaces of Rm. All right, so now you can ask yourself, well, suppose I take a product of these functions evaluated bjx, x is, a, is, is, is in Rm, and I would like to bound this by, say, the product of certain LP norms of the functions in their own variable, hi, uh, p norm, so LP. Okay? Can you prove something like this? So what would you have to do? And then, of course, there's a constant, right? And this constant will depend on the b's and everything. So, so what you would like to do is you would like to actually optimize this problem, j equals 1. I mean, this is k. It doesn't matter. fj. I forgot to say k here. lp. And you, what you would like to find is what is the supremum of that gadget? over all such functions, OK? So that's the problem. Now, you agree. I mean, this is, this is unsolvable, right? And what Brascom and Leap, and, uh, and uh, actually, it was later Leap, mostly, who realized this, said, well, you see, instead of the theorem is, instead of optimizing this over all functions, it satisfies, it's, 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 it suffices to optimize only over Gaussians. So in other words, all you have to do is you take the fj to be Gaussian functions with some, you know, what is a Gaussian function? A Gaussian function is a quadratic form in the exponent. Yeah? No shifts, nothing. You just plug these Gaussians in. We know how to compute integrals with Gaussians. And then you optimize. But of course, when you compute this integral with these Gaussians, you get, of course, extremely, exceedingly complicated functions in terms of the bi and the variances of these Gaussians. These are usually unsolvable problems. Huh? But this is his theorem, and that's a fantastic theorem, because we know how to compute with Gaussians. Okay? Now, let me give you now a rigorous version of that theorem, where you actually can compute the constant. And that's a theorem which comes from convex analysis, believe it or not. This, 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 all that stuff has, has uh, beautiful applications to, to volumes of convex sets. So let me write down this theorem. I'm gonna, now this is Braskamp Lieb. I should also mention Keith Ball. Uh, by the way, at the end of the, of the course, I give you a list of references about all that stuff, right? I think that's, that's pre presumably the most useful thing about the course at the end. And also Frank Barthe. Okay. So, now what is the theorem? Let me make sure that I don't make me too many mistakes. So, for I, equals 1 up to k, let hi in Rm <laughs> be subspaces 
of dimension. Let me call the dimensions psi. Okay. Pi from Rm to Hi linear maps. with the property that bi, bi transposed is the identity on hi. So that denotes the identity map on HI. So it's not the identity matrix, right? Because the identity matrix would always refer to the basic standard basic of RM. I just call it the identity, uh, the, the, the identity on the Hilbert space, okay? Next. Assume further. that there exist numbers, non-negative, uh, positive numbers, you should say, I, I equals 1 up to k, so that this, this important relation, the sum ci I transposed B I. Huh? Notice now I here is B I transposed B I. This, by the way, says that B I is transposed. Uh, B I is an isometry, hmm? and, and and here we have B I transposed B I. Okay, that's reversed. What should the sum be? Let's assume that the sum is now the identity on M. So that's really the identity matrix in RM. Okay? Then. For any collection of non-negative functions, F i i from I should say h i into the reals i equals one up to n to k the integral and let me write it this way product i equals one to k the integral over R m F i of b i x x and here erase it to the power c i is less or equals product i equals 1 to k. The integral over f i, now over its own Hilbert space, to the power c i. So this is, and you notice here now, I have really a constant, the constant is 1. And that's sharp, it's best possible. What are the optimizers? Well, I don't have time anymore, but next time, uh, I will show you that the optimizers are Gaussian. That's very easy to see. That follows immediately from this relation. And in fact, I will also try to convince you that this is an inequality which you surely have seen in certain versions. Namely, it goes back to an inequality by Loomis and Whitney from 1948, and uh, which you, by the way, use in the proof of the Sobolev inequality namely the L2 norm of, uh, the L1 norm of the gradient is greater or equals the n, n minus 1 norm of F. You use that inequality implicitly. Okay? So I show this because it's a very simple example. And then I try to give you a proof, and I would like to apply this now to a new topic in, in, um, in the Katz model, namely to thermostats. And it raises some interesting mathematical issues. Okay? Good. So then I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.